yeah, like you were saying, a little bit better. The crop's down on this end, a lot better there. And then look at this middle. Look at this yep. low spot in the middle. Boy, is that something. And then it really favors the grasses. And they're not too happy either, though. I had a program on my farm that drained nearly all the fields. And I never had puddles when it rained, except for this one area which I couldn't drain. And so I leveled it off in terraces and grew rice. Were you able to flood it? Yeah, yeah, I flooded it. Yeah, I flooded yeah. it. I, there's, there's upland rice that you don't have to flood. And we've got some of that growing in Australia, where I lived in Australia, was a big biodynamic rice farm that didn't flood their fields, and they grew upland rice, several varieties. What variety did you grow? Did you grow the Carolina golden rice? No, no, and there's a Georgia golden rice too. Oh, interesting. That they were grown by slaves back in the middle of the 19th century. So Brunswick, Georgia was growing golden rice. Uh, but no, I grew five varieties of Lundberg had a five rice mix and they had a black and a red and a brown and a, well, a white or whatever. They had, they had five different strains sure. of rice in it. Plus I also planted basmati. And if I had my pick of the rice I really liked the most, it was the basmati. It smelled like popcorn at the theater out there in the rice field. Stop it. It was like, wow, wow. <laughs> popcorn at the theater, it's a great smell. <laughs> so here, Hugh, we have, this couple weeks ago looked great. We had a really dense cover crop and you could see the residue. You know, we, we crimped it, yep. put it down, looking pretty good. Vetches and... Uh... Yeah, the vetch is, is kind of taken over from uh, its own seed bank. Yeah, it's made, it made seed and it's coming up again. You had peas, you had... We had uh, peas, yep. Uh, that looks like wheat maybe, or rye. it could have been rye. Yep, yep, rye, I see the rye. Yep, so... Uh, so here we have sweet potatoes and we have Jeff's popping um, golden nugget here. You know, it's a nice variety, they're super sweet, but they're not, the foliage is not very dense as opposed to a Beauregard or something that kind of takes over the area. So here we're, you know, we're under weed pressure. Again, you can really, you can see the grasses popping and starting to get ahead of us. I use sweet potatoes as a ground cover under my bananas and other tropical fruits. So it made like a, a mat. It, mm -hmm. it just, it overwhelmed all the other weeds. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, these are coming on. These, we got in late, but they're starting to come on. And we grew a decent crop of sweet potatoes last year. I mean, sweet potatoes are not hard to grow. No, that was one of the reasons that George Washington Carver advocated growing sweet potatoes is they grew on very poor soils. Yeah, they yeah, like smart, clay smart though. Man. They like that southern soils. Yeah, they that did. That Alabama red clay there at Tuskegee was just sweet potato land. That and peanuts. He was a real yep. advocate for peanuts. Well, it built the land back. Yeah, yeah. It's a legume. And yeah, after, after cotton had completely, like, uh, taken everything the soil had there, and it couldn't even hold itself together, and it eroded and everything, and what were people going to do? Their survival depended on, they grew their own food. Yeah, yeah. So we have, you know, we have a laneway here in the middle, but this first section's all sweet potatoes. So what do you think? Well, what it, do you think about the weed pressure? Boy, it's starting <clears throat> to pop up here. Well, it's not very great yet, but it's- It's, it's, it's on its the, way. The sweet potatoes better get it on. Yeah, yeah. And they don't look super vigorous. I mean, no, they're they not don't. deep in color or anything. No, they don't. They could use the sulfur. They can use the sulfur as well. Yep. Yeah. Gypsum would be the recipe on these fields, I think. Uh, you don't have very many soils that are uh, high pH. 
So gypsum isn't going to change the pH, but it's, it's not what you would use on an alkaline soil. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if it's really high pH, then you'd use elemental sulfur. Mm -hmm. But this weed here, it promises to get six feet tall, if not eight. Yeah, yeah. And sweet potatoes don't do that. They don't do that, do they? No, no, they, they need something a lot shorter. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Well, as I said, we were hoping the residue was going to be thick enough, but it's and, just and not... It's, it suppressed some weeds, but not everything. Not, not near enough, yeah. There is a lot of nice biology in here, though. Yeah, you can see rye we're doing and vetch just make a terrific, like, dose of, of life for the soil. Yeah, yeah. But also the grasses love it. Well, some of the things that you've got growing here, like, for instance, this portulaca, what's it the called? The portulaca, uh, yeah. Purslane. Purslane, yep. And, and it's, it's a potash-loving plant. It comes up where there's available potash, so your, so your potash is, is soluble. Your potash is soluble here. On a lot of your soil tests, your potash is low, soluble potash. On the soil you've got, tests he, on the You've farm. got enormous amounts of potash in the soil here, but most of it's not soluble. But in this case, it is. And probably that's a result of having the rye and uh, vetch mm -hmm. precede it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can really see the vetch is, is coming on a whole another round here. This is another indicator that if when you planted this, it would have been good to give it a soil drench of humic acid because mm -hmm. that would have sequestered it then it would have fed the soluble potash to the soil food web mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and the soil food web would have sequestered that potash and your tall woody weeds like uh, red root pigweed would be thwarted then so it can we come be... back with a compost tea and have humic acid in that would that help yeah now if you with this, I would rather have an EM uh, brew rather than a compost tea because the EM brew ties up the nutrients a lot better. And the EM brew helps to make silica available and it has an antioxidant effect. Now this is a real antioxidant plant, really rich in antioxidants. Yeah, it's a superfood. It's, yeah, it's, it's really one the of the superfoods, yeah. Especially where it's taken over. Oh, there's a Dutch variety of this that is really, a, it's a salad vegetable. Mm -hmm. I mean, it grows fast enough and big enough that you could sell it and actually make money on it. A Dutch variety? A Dutch variety, okay. yeah. Yeah, we'll have to look into that. It's a, yes, we it's could a definitely salad first lane. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, well, it's saying that it could grow it. Mm-hmm. Because it's, it's volunteering pretty good. Yeah. Should we go down here where the corn is um, popping up a little yeah. bit better? This would be a good sweet potato soil if you cured its deficiencies. And one of its deficiencies that I'm seeing is boron. Is boron. Yeah, what are the characteristic deficiencies of boron when you see it? It's got the... Not a lot of structure, hollow stem. It's what? How do you see? How do you pick that out in the plants? Well, we can see some areas here that are not boron deficient. I mean, when you've got a corn stalk that's this big around in diameter, that's surely not boron deficient. Mm -hmm. It was when the soil tests, they were low in this area, though, with the boron. It fascinates me. There's so much variation in the field here, you know, even from 10 feet over to here. What variety of corn? This is a bloody butcher. Oh, okay. So it's a big, tall, open big pollinated taller. variety. Yep. Okay. It's one I've been saving for maybe a decade now, and we grew it last year out here, and we had some decent success with it. So I had grown it, and I planted some seed. It was like 
12 or 15 years old and it didn't come up. Oh yeah, yeah. So so my old seed was too old. It didn't it didn't mm -hmm. a single one of them sprout. Mhm. Mm and we drilled this at the same time with clover. So we tried to tried to under we tried to drill clover in to get a cover crop underneath it. And we had, you know, we've got a little bit coming in here. But it was still, it was hot and drying a little bit late, so the clover. This was drilled into oats and not rye. No, this was the same, well, oats are part of the, oats were part of the cover crop mix. Well, the oats survived. The, the oats survived the winter. Yeah, they didn't die off. And they survived being crimped. That's kind of interesting. This Johnson grass, I guess? I'm thinking so. Yeah. Yep. <clears throat> not an easy one to defeat with. It's not easy, is it? No. I'd be tempted to pull it out because I don't see any others. Well, it's here. Yeah, I see another one over there. I do see another. And it's not old enough to make those nice... Oh, those the rhizomes. Yet. The rhizomes that look like tapeworms. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> the tapeworm rhizomes, my favorite. <laughs> it's a terrific plant. Wow. <laughs> yeah, it's. And and the bean that you have planted in this corn is what? Um, it's something from the mix that has gotten loose. So it could be a cow pea, perhaps. Mm, I don't know. It looks. <laughs> it could be a cow pea. Yep. Yeah, it's cow pea. Yeah. Might be a black eye. Yeah, I think it's cow pea that was in the cover crop mix. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. It's just not following a simple direction. It's not, it's going every which direction. What is? The, the, the planting scheme here. Yeah, it really is. It's, it's good for research. It's not good for production. That's true. That's true. Well, I hope we'll, well get our you, soils right you, we'll if, if you learn from both. your mistakes, this is great. Yeah, if you don't learn, then <laughs> you do this every year. Boy, you got a problem. It's interesting, the dock here is a lot different than the dock down there. Yeah, it's, same uh, variety, longer, but, it, but it's Longer much, leaves, narrow, and it doesn't favor it. It, it hasn't gone to seed yet. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The others, have, they have gone to seed. Well, oh, yeah, well, we keep going well, down. Well. The corn gets better and better down here. It sure does. You'll actually get something back from it. I mean, I'm tempted to to do something over here, maybe to flail mow that front of the field and drill it again. You'd know you were getting in the right direction if you did something to it and it sort of snapped out of it and started growing properly. Mm -hmm. So you think we could still do something with that end. I'd be experimenting kind of to see what kind of levels of sulfur and boron, because those are the two, two like even even more key than the silica. And I'd use some rock dust on it too to see if mm -hmm. the silica helped. Mm -hmm. I would experiment with it to see if I could could get some activity going there. Mm -hmm. But you've got that whole big. That's that's a big area there. Yeah, it's a large that area. That was in cover crop that the whole thing failed. Yeah, yeah. So you might not particularly need to experiment with the corn when you've got that whole field there to experiment There's plenty on. of experiments to do here, huh? Yeah. Yeah. That's okay. what I'm saying. Yeah. There's, yeah. there's plenty of room for experiment. When you get your soils balanced out, and then the weed pressure is less, yeah? Yeah. It, we don't favor the weeds anymore. I found that I got rid of Bermuda grass and this, uh, like, sedge that grows in yeah, yeah, wet the areas yeah, and yeah. nut grass mm -hmm. and even comfrey. Even comfrey. I got rid of them by growing corn and soybeans and completely, like, smothered them. Now, did you did you did you have the corn? Was it under sowed with the soybeans, or was that just a separate was, crop? The soybeans were sowed in between the corn rows, uh -huh. and I got a hay variety of soybeans, and it sprawled. And you had to walk down through there like that. Oh, you yeah. couldn't 
you couldn't walk through the field. You had to really like, like you were going through deep snow. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you see here the width of the, the corn leaf. Oh yeah. It's really nice, the it's length. Almost, it's almost as good as it should be. Yeah, almost, amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Do you, can you say anything about this? Uh, this may not be the best example, but you know, just seeing, just as an indicator, the stripes in the corn leaf, and then these white areas, and some of them have it worse. It's like something was in the whorl. Okay, so it's way more back of an when, insect. And, and, and it, it must have scavenged off the surface of the leaf or something mm -hmm. there. So it's not a soil deficiency. I wouldn't have thought much. so. The yeah. streaks are more more so. Mm -hmm. You won't see those streaks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can really uh, see it in that one. Yeah. yeah, see how that's got lighter and darker streaks? Yeah. And if it's going good, well, then it doesn't have those streaks. It doesn't have those streaks. Yeah, because it's getting enough magnesium that it just, it, it does everything. It does, it does the whole thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you see it's growing better here. And then, you know, we're starting to see less weed pressure. Oh, yeah. Oh, day. yeah, definitely. If it gets up there, then it beats the weeds. Mm -hmm. And it was the best thing I had for weed suppression was growing a corn crop. The best. It was the, it got rid of pernicious weeds that I couldn't get rid of even with cultivation. Oh, really? Doc is one of those, but mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I ended up with, just the odd thistle or dock, sure. just, you know, straggler. just, yeah, in a place or two, I might have a few, but farm. I, yeah, I defeated them and I was growing corn without any fertilizer as my best soil improvement crop. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I didn't, well, I didn't do anything but just plant right? my corn, Yeah, you know? Oh, if corn feeds a free fixers. Mm -hmm. And many of these are far more efficient than the ones that cause nodules on legumes. Mm -hmm. So, and some of them are phosphorus solubilizers and they do other things besides just fixing nitrogen. But there's huge numbers of nitrogen fixing bacteria. Mm -hmm. So when the conditions are right for nitrogen fixing bacteria, there's nitrogen fixing bacteria that live in the corn stalks. Mm -hmm. In Amazing. the plant. In the plant. In the plant. Uh, we found one that lives in sugarcane in Australia called Acetobacter. But there are also Clostridia that fix nitrogen in the anaerobic environment in the interior of the plant. Wow. Yeah, you don't hear so, about that every day, do you? No, but see, you, you study soil microbiology, you have to learn those things. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the agenda in the ag department was to keep people away from finding those things out because then they might abandon the fertilizer industry. They wouldn't want that because everything else depends on that. Well, especially their funding dependent the funding on it. funding and all the other <laughs> products that they've come up with to combat all the problems that go with it. Okay, so we keep well, carrying. Go ahead. You know, I mean, money is in control of our science. It's in control of our politics. Uh, so we have the best government that money can buy too, because it's... <laughs> <laughs> well, look at here. Boy, we've really got a, a row of purslane going. Interesting. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it came up real well right yeah. there. Yeah, and this is where it was disturbed. We brought the and, seed drill down through here. What do you suppose the variability of the growth in the corn is? In a relatively close area, there are plants that are small and plants that are big, is that a genetic issue with the seed or is that about the biology in the soil not allowing or nutrients being tied up into zones? You, you know, is it a biological issue? With it is a biological issue. Okay. Uh, and basically, when we talk about a soil food web, 
that implies it's a network. Mm. And if you got the web working, then it would be a network and you wouldn't see that variability. But what's happening is you only have a few pieces of it working that is working to the extent that they should be working. So you've only got a few patches here and there and, uh, you know, and it's not, it needs to be fed. And the type of food that it needs to be fed probably under the circumstances because you don't have the labor for this, you couldn't produce it on your own farm. You'd have to import soluble humic acids because they would feed the soil fungi and then you would get that web. So, so to feed the soil food web is like, and the corn here is feeding it. So where the corn is growing is you're gonna establish the soil food web better there. And the rest of this area here is still going downhill. And you couldn't plant corn over there and have it do that because it would do like what's going on yep. there. And it's, it's kind of like, you know, which one came first, the chicken or the egg? You have, to, you have to have the egg before you can get a chicken, but you have to have the chicken before you can get an egg. So, uh, so this field has supported really incredibly lush multi-species cover crops which included a whole bunch of millets and sorghums and stuff, wouldn't they be responding the same way as the corn? Here's the thing, why did it do that? There, have you used chicken manure or something else like that as an input? No, we used compost. But not, not to those multi-species cover crops, they were put on the soil with nothing but inoculant and that was it. Well, yeah, mid-season, I don't know if you remember last year, but the cover crops were really poor and then we ended up spreading some compost on them and they definitely they took a but in previous years took a job we didn't give them anything yeah. and they were big and tall and green you know last year was the wettest year on record so it wasn't a sure. good year to try and judge you know but we had david um brant out here and he was like going crazy with how vital the cover crops were you know right here on these fields they were like 12 feet tall green as can be well i haven't correlated which soil tests go to which areas. But I've got the soil test mapped out there. Yeah, he's printed some out. Yep. Uh, <clears throat> do you know what relates to this? Well, because the, it, the it, it, this is a clue. It's just sure. a clue. Yeah. They're not actually testing life in there. There's no test for how much, uh, you know, oxygen. There's a test for the, how much carbon and how much nitrogen's there but there isn't a test for a whole lot of other things. So There's we no field. test for the overall vitality, see? Sure. We're in, we're in field A, and right now we're in plot two, basically, or the second soil test. Okay. And the first soil test was down there. Can I see that yeah, let me just, see let's see if I can get to it here. And let's see, so here you go. This is A2, okay? Yes, and it's super, super low in sulfur and boron and silicon, and pretty low in manganese. Manganese is a cofactor with silicon. So but I'm components. looking at nitrate and it's 30 parts per million. That's, that's over the top. See how that nitrate line is high? Is that the nitrate? Oh, yeah. Nitrates are high. Nitrate or phosphorus? <clears throat> uh, phosphorus is super high. 370 parts per million phosphorus? Holy smoke, that's high. <laughs> so we're not seeing phosphorus deficiency in anything out here. But the fact is that phosphorus depends on sulfur and boron and silicon to do any good for the plants. And when they're not working, well, then the phosphorus which is plenty abundant, is not really Available. producing growth. Mm -hmm. It's just building up in the plants. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's not being used. Mm -hmm. Which it's, yeah, boy, is that plenty of phosphorus. 
Now, how would we get so much phosphorus? Would that be from applications from the previous farmers? Could or have been. Yeah. Could have been that they used a phosphorus fertilizer. Could have been that they spread chicken litter. Mm -hmm. They definitely did not spread chicken litter. They were bag farmers all the way. Plastic okay. bag and chemicals. So, so they, they spread it as, as phosphoric acid, basically. Mm -hmm. But I'm wondering about the compost we put out. And actually, we might have a test that is close to like from over there that yep. Meredith took before you put the compost out. Mm -hmm. So if we can compare the two, we might see if the compost had an impact. Mm -hmm. Over here on your total test, the phosphorus is 1,429 parts per million. So you'll never run out of phosphorus in this field. Your potassium is also real high. See how potassium is high? And in the total test, you've got huge, huge reserves of potassium. So you'll never run out of potassium either. Mm -hmm. It's... It's just the, the finite key elements to kick off the bio sequence. That's what you're thinking it is with the, with the sulfur, the boron, the silica. Ideally, sulfur should be 1 60th of carbon, but it's nowhere near that. This would be, with the carbon in your soil, you should have 620 parts per million sulfur in your soil. You've got only 218 in the total test. And in the soluble test, where you should have 50 parts per million, you've got eight, 8.3. So you're super, super sulfur deficient. Mm -hmm. how would you which, which I was saying when we looked at the field, of course. Huh? How, would you, how would you amend it? Would you do, it, would you do a top dressing or? I, I would get a spreader truck out here and spread gypsum if I could. I don't know whether you can even find gypsum in your area. Did you see, so huh? those fields that we sampled early spring, because we knew we would be planting on the edge, Yeah. we applied, didn't we, elemental sulfur? We never applied. Never put we, it down. We didn't apply it, no. Okay. Yep. Okay, so yep. those are effectively the same the as same. these. Yeah. yeah, the only thing we've done is spread compost and then the carbonatite. Okay, See, and I'm, worried, I'm worried about that, you, because the carbonatite's very high calcium, and if we put gypsum out, might we end up putting too much calcium out? I don't think so, but, uh, yeah, your calcium isn't real excessive, but if you have real high calcium and magnesium and whatnot, and you do, your, all of your cations are high, then you could put out elemental sulfur. And elemental sulfur, you can't handle it. It's a powder. If it's 100%, you know, sulfur, it's a powder. You go trying to spread it, it gets in your mucous membranes. And it, as it, gets moist, it turns into sulfate, which is the salt of sulfuric acid, and it's very uncomfortable experience. So you get, the elemental sulfur you get would, needs to be combined with bentonite, so that it's about 10% bentonite, and then it's a spreadable flake or prill that you can handle without getting it in your nose. So that's... Would it work to use um, moistened, maybe moistened with EM um, charcoal? We have an abundance of charcoal. Yeah, the charcoal's a really good thing. Uh, and it should be charged. Uh, some biochar makers actually catch the pyrolysis gases by bubbling the gas through a solution that takes the sulfur and other compounds out of it. And then that vinegar or pyrolysis vinegar, gas yeah. is, is used to charge the charcoal. And that's an interesting alchemical process that goes back into the so-called dark ages, okay. which were more ages of enlightenment than today, but anyway. <laughs> Okay, how about we, we're going to run out of time if we don't keep oh, yeah, moving we're here. Run out of time. Uh, yeah. <laughs>